Hello there future ACCAs, I welcome you all to this session. I'm a proud friend of Rama Vishnu Vijay, annual lecturer for the Advanced Performance Management paper. So folks, I welcome you all to the APM Revision Bootcamp. So, what exactly is a bootcamp? Let's first of all understand that, shall we? So when it comes to the Revision Bootcamp, it's basically a course structured in two phases. In phase one, we will be revising through the key examinable areas so that you can, you know, revise your understanding regarding the concepts and topics that we've covered throughout the syllabus of APM. And of course, you can also use this for revision purposes for, uh, you know, a few days close to your exam as well. And that's basically what phase one is all about. And in phase two, we will be practicing questions, okay, folks, because as we all know, Practicing question is as important as learning the syllabus, isn't it? So ultimately, our you know skills will be assessed by the examiner in the exam. So we will have to learn how to present our answer in the most appropriate uh, manner and use our judgment to tackle various you know scenarios as well. So we will be practicing a lot of exam standard as well as past paper questions so that you can get the hang of it, you can learn all the exam techniques that you, you can utilize to score those easy marks, to score those technical marks, as well as those professional marks as well. Okay, folks, so that is basically what the uh, second phase is all about. Now, let's get into it, shall we? So let's get started with the first phase, that is the revision phase, shall we? As you can see here, we have the entire syllabus of EPM partitioned into various syllabus areas. Now, let's get started with the first syllabus area that is part A, strategic planning and control, where we learned about a lot of interesting topics, isn't it? So let's quickly go through each of these topics one by one, okay folks, so that you know, uh, so that you can refresh your memory regarding these topics. So the first thing that we've learned here is basically about costing, isn't it? So what is costing? Costing is basically the process of determining the cost of product services or activities conducted by a organization, business organization. That's basically as to what costing is. And then we looked at several costing techniques, isn't it? So first of all, we learned about the traditional method of costing that is absorption costing. And what do we do in absorption costing? We consolidate all of the overheads or indirect costs within the organization and divide it based on, you know, labor hours or machine hours, etc., isn't it? So that's basically what we do here. So let's quickly take a look at that. Absorption costing is a form of costing in which the cost of products are calculated by adding an amount of indirect cost, uh, indirect production cost or overheads to the direct cost of production. So what do we do here, guys? We basically just add a, a portion of the indirect cost to each of our products. That's basically what we do in absorption costing. And we learned about all the calculation methods and stuff. So remember all that, those are really important. Now, moving on to the next aspect, we have, we also look at ABC costing or activity-based costing as well, isn't it? So what is activity-based costing all about? Activity-based costing is a method of costing which involves identifying the cost of the main support activities and the factors that drive the cost of each activities as well. So in absorption costing, what we used to do is, we just, you know, in order to allocate an indirect cost to our product, what we do is we take, take the entire overhead cost amount or the total overheads and divide it by either machine hours or labor hours or any other basis that we determined, isn't it? So that's basically what we do in absorption costing. But the problem with that is that we may not allocate the appropriate amount of cost to the appropriate, uh, you know, product or appropriate department. That's basically the thing. Okay, folks, so what we have is we have a, a bit more modernized form of costing technique that is activity based costing. And here what we do is we take a look at the driving factor of cost and then we allocate the cost depending upon the driving factors of each product line. Okay, folks, so that's basically how activity based cost works. Okay, folks, as simple as that. And then we look at uh, target costing. And what is target costing all about? It involves setting a target cost by subtracting the desired profit from a competitive market price. It's kind of straightforward. All you have to do is, first of all, you just have to determine the uh, the, the particular you know sales volume that you want to sell and then the selling price. And then, uh, you know, uh, you have to determine the desired level of profits that you want. And then you deduct this particular profit from the selling price. Okay, folks, then you will get the target cost. 
and the target after the target cost has been determined what we do is we determine the estimated cost based on you know the realistic activities and then we compare the estimated cost with the target cost and identify any differences and we call this difference the cost gap isn't it so that's basically as to what the step by step process is all about okay folks step by step process of target costing is all about it's pretty straightforward and quite simple to remember as well isn't it as simple as that so our ultimate objective here in target costing is to reduce the target cost gap isn't it so that's basically the idea here and then we looked at life cycle costing which is yet again a really uh, easy and straightforward process isn't it what do we do here we take the total cost over the entire life cycle of the product and then we divide it by the total number of units to determine the price of that particular product okay folks so that's basically it life cycle costing tracks and accumulates cost and revenues attributable to each product over its entire life cycle as simple as that and yeah the, it, there's an equation provided here that is total cost of product a over its entire life divided by the total number of units of a, a is basically an example product here okay folks so that's basically the case now uh, moving on so using this total pro using this life cycle costing technique the total profitability of a given product can be determined isn't it because we are looking at the entire life cycle of a particular product so we would be able to you know forecast as, as to whether to a certain extent we would be able to forecast as to whether you know this particular product will be profitable or not isn't it now uh, then we looked at the you know the the graph demonstrating the life cycle of a particular product as you can see here we have five phases we have the development phase where we you know conduct research and development to develop that particular product and during this phase we we incur loss isn't it there's a lot of cost involved and there is no revenue here so there won't be any profit or anything but rather there would only be loss okay folks and then we have the next phase that is introduction this is basically when the particular uh, product is introduced into the market, isn't it? So during introduction, we can, you know, get some revenue or sales with us. However, there won't be much profits. Why exactly is that? Because we, we've just introduced it into the market, isn't it? So uh, there would be a lot of advertising expenses and various other expenses, which exceeds the revenue that we obtain. Okay, folks, so that's basically the uh, introduction phase. And then we move on to the growth phase. And this is when we start to get profits. Okay, folks, when we move from the, uh, you know, introduction phase to the, uh, you know, growth phase, uh, we touch the break even point right here. And then we may start making profits. Okay, folks, so as sales increases, profits will also increase accordingly. And then after that, we will reach the next stage. That is the maturity stage where we reach the maximum point of sales and the maximum level of profits. And after a certain time, it starts to decline. Okay, folks, it, 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 it moves to the next phase, that is the decline phase, where the sales will be reduced or the profit will start to decrease uh, as well. Okay, folks, so at this point, the, the management of that particular organization may, may take one of two decisions. Either they would plan to shut down that particular product or they would, you know, uh, make in, take initiatives in order to extend the maturity period as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea behind a life cycle of a particular product, as simple as that. Now, we also learned about environmental management accounting and some environmental management accounting techniques as well, isn't it? So let's quickly look, uh, look through that. EMA or uh, environmental management accounting is the generation and analysis of both financial and non-financial information in order to support internal environmental management processes. That's basically what the uh, you know uh, environmental management accounting is. We we use both financial as well as non-financial information for uh, you know uh, environmental management processes. That's basically it. In turn, to support internal uh, environmental management. Uh, processes okay folks so keep this in mind and there are several techniques to you know account for this uh, there's a technique known as input output analysis and what is this all about let's take a look it operates on the principle that what comes in must go out output is split across sold and stored goods and waste measuring these categories in physical quantities and monetary terms forces a business to focus on environmental cost flow diagrams uh, are often used to illustrate how the input is split across different outputs such as stored goods and waste. So what's the idea here guys? What comes in must go out, isn't it? If we are uh, providing 100% input, then ideally 100% output should com come out, isn't it? However, when, when we are you know taking a look at reality, what's going to happen is we might put 100% of input. However, the output that we get would be split into various segments. For example, uh, you know, there would be uh, 
you know, 80% of it would be output, whereas 20% would be waste. Okay, folks, so that's basically the thing. That's basically the idea here. By looking at this particular flow of things, the organization will be forced to think about, okay, so what exactly are the environmental impact here? Because, you know, as wastage increases, and the environmental impact will also increase, isn't it? So we will try to make efforts to reduce waste, save costs, etc. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. Moving on to the next aspect, we have flow cost accounting as well. This is kind of similar to uh, input output analysis. However, the uh, there's a bit, uh, it, it, they basically have a bit of a different sort of categorization to it. That's basically it. Okay, folks, so uh, it inputs and outputs are measured through each individual pr process of production. Uh, a distinction is be made between uh, positive products as well as negative products. Okay, folks, so positive is the good output, whereas negative product is basically the measurement of waste. So in this technique, the materials flow through an organization is divided into three categories. Okay, folks, so uh, each uh, the, and the cost of each category is measured separately. So we have the three categories are basically material, there will be raw materials, etc, isn't it? And then the systems, the, uh, this is basically the in-house handling that is required, including labor and its cost. And then there is delivery and disposal. Uh, which is basically the cost of transport and the cost of disposal of waste as well. Okay, folks, so in each of these categories, we identify what are the negative output as well as the positive output. That's basically as to what the uh, flow cost accounting is all about. And then we look at environmental activity-based uh, uh, costing, which is kind of similar to the you know normal activity-based costing as well. Okay, folks, so uh, it combined elements of environmental costing with activity-based costing system. The main challenge with environmental activity costing is to identify the hidden environmental cost and link them to environmental activities. Okay, folks, so it's kind of difficult to identify hidden costs, you know, hidden environmental costs within the uh, you know organization. Okay, folks, so that's basically the, one of the difficulties. And of course, charging the cost to each environmental activity to individual product cost according to the amount of uh, that each product is responsible for the uh, environmental activity. So if you're applying activity-based costing principles, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the environmental cost within the organization, which is hidden, by the way, uh, kind of difficult to detect. However, we still you know, identify it. However, what exactly would the driving factors of these things would be? Determining that as well as, you know, calculating the uh, final final cost incurred for each of the each activity would be a bit of a difficult process. That's basically what we're trying to state here, as simple as that. However, you know, it is, it, 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 if it's, you know, worth the, if the benefit exceeds the cost, then there's no problem to it, isn't it? So keep this in mind. And then we have environmental life cycle costing, which is basically kind of a straightforward process. All we're trying to do is we're trying to calculate the environmental cost that a particular product inwards incurs over its entire life cycle. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. There would be costs such as decommissioning costs or removal costs, etc. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to read through this particular sentence once. Environmental costs for a product are considered from the design stage of the product uh, right up to the end of its life cycle cost. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So we calculate all the cost of you know possible wastage that can be incurred and once everything is done what exactly would be the cost of decommissioning or removal of certain uh, you know fixated assets etc so all these things are uh, considered within the environmental life cycle cost now moving on to the next aspect that is performance management so now we're you know moving away from the costing set of topics and moving on to the you know strategic planning and control related topics shall we so let's take a look so in performance management, what's the idea here? What is performance management? It's basically managing the performance of an organization, isn't it? So performance management is any activity that is con uh, that is constructed to enhance the organization's performance and make sure that it meets its goal. Our ob ultimate objective here is to meet the objectives of the organization or uh, you know help the organization achieve its objective through managing its performance. That's basically the idea here. And in APM, we focus both on internal as well as external factors. Okay, folks, so in, let's say your PM paper, you may have, you know, talked about internal factors such as budgeting or decision-making techniques or, uh, you know, uh, CVP analysis, etc. isn't it? However, when it comes to APM, we're gonna, we're gonna you know, expand our uh, thinking from internal 
to external as well. Okay, folks, it's not just external, but you know, both internal factors are as well as external factors are considered as well. Now, uh, internally, we focus on factors such as management accounting, strategic planning and control, as well as performance measurement. And externally, we focus on the economy, the market and other environmental related aspects so that we can you know, make the right decision at the right time, isn't it? So that's basically the uh, overall idea here. So now let's talk more about strategic planning and control. So what's the idea here, guys? The uh, fundamental aspect of uh, performance management uh, are planning and control and strategic planning is concerned with where an organization wants to be and how you get there. So what we basically do is we set the objective and we, uh, you know, we, we plan as to how to get to that objective. Okay, folks, so in, in a bit, to put it in a bit more simple sense, we set the objective as well as the strategy or the course of action to get to that objective as well. So that's basically the idea here. And what is controlling? Controlling is all about uh, uh, monitoring the planned activity and taking and suggesting corrective action. So what we do is we compare the planned activities with what has actually happened. We identify any deviations or variances, if any, and we investigate into it or take corrective action to reduce this gap. Okay, folks? So that's basically as to what we do in uh, controlling. Okay, folks? Now, moving on to the next aspect. Strategic analysis, choice and implementation. So we're going to move on to some set of topics which you might be a bit familiar uh, from your SBL paper as well. However, the really important point to note here is that when it comes to APM, APM is not SBL. Okay, folks, we, we have similar topics. However, the purpose of using these topics are totally different. In SBL, you may have utilized models as well as various, uh, you know, techniques in order to, uh, let's say, uh, provide just some comments and observations, isn't it? Or you may have just uh, conducted an assessment of the organization as a whole or using, let's say, various models such as pest analysis or Porter's Five Force model, etc. Okay, folks. However, when it comes to APM, it's all about the, this particular question. Okay, folks, all you have to do is ask yourselves, how exactly can you use the particular model in order to manage the performance or improve the performance of the organization and help them achieve their objective. Okay, folks. So this is the question that you have to ask whenever you're using a particular model in a particular question. Okay, folks. So that's basically the purpose here. Okay, folks. So we're primarily oriented towards the performance of an organization rather than the overall strategic stuff. Okay, folks. So that's basically the thing. Now, uh, moving on to this particular model right here, that is strategic analysis, choice and implementation. So what's the idea here, guys? It's all about how we implement a strategy, isn't it? So first of all, there is strategic analysis where we conduct an external analysis uh, to identify opportunities and threats within the external environment. And we also conduct an internal analysis to identify the strength and weaknesses of the organization itself. And after that, we conduct a stakeholder analysis to assess the power and interest of different stakeholders. And isn't there a model in order to do that? What model was that? The straight, uh, the mental loss matrix, isn't it? So that's basically something that we can do. And what else? We also conduct a gap analysis to identify the differences between the desired and expected objective as well. Okay, folks, what is the, what is the difference here? The expected objective is basically our mission. Okay, folks, that's basically it. Sorry, uh, the desired objective is basically the ultimate mission or objective that the organization has. However, the expected objective is basically the current, you know, objective based on the current activities that we're conducting. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. If there is a gap, then that can be an issue. So we need to close the gap, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Now, moving on to the next aspect, strategic choice. So after conducting this analysis, we would be, you know, determining a lot of strategies that we could, uh, you know, take in order to achieve our objectives and do various stuff, isn't it? Now, uh, the next aspect is just choose from these objectives. So let's uh, take a look at as to how that's done, shall we? Strategies are required to uh, close the gap. So if one of the strategies are can, you know, close the gap when which we've identified through conducting a gap analysis, then we can choose that one. And of course, a competitive strategy will be formulated for each business unit and direction for growth, which basically means that which market or product should be invested in should also be determined. And of course, whether ex expansion should be achieved by organic growth acquisition or some form of joint arrangement should also be determined as well. Okay, folks, so these are some of the factors that are considered when, uh, you know, selecting the perfect course of action or strategy to achieve our objective. And finally, there is the implementation aspect. So we planned everything and we've selected our strategy. So the final aspect to do here is to implement that strategy, isn't it? So we, uh, you know, formulate a detailed plan and budget. And of course, we set 
you know, uh, targets for KPI as well as there is monitoring and controlling activities being conducted to improve performance as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically what the strategic uh, analysis, choice and implementation is all about. Now, moving on to another model that is the SAF model. So what is the SAF model all about? Let's take a look. Strategic choice should be assessed using the three cri criteria. Okay, folks, so each of the, you know, alternative strategies that we've come up with should be assessed using three criteria. We look at the suitability of that particular strategy. We look at the acceptability of that particular strategy and we look at the feasibility of that particular strategy as well. So what is suitability all about? Does the strategy have a suitable, suitable strategic fit to the organization? That is, is it built on strengths and does it take advantage of opportunities? This is what we look at when we, when we talk about suitability. And when we talk about acceptability, we take a look at as to whether the strategy is acceptable to the street stakeholders of the organization, both in terms of risk and return. And finally, when we talk about feasibility, can, uh, can necessary resources and competencies be obtained in order to you know, conduct these activities so can, uh, or implement this particular strategy? And can the organization manage the process of strategic change? So we might be following a current strategy and since we are planning on a new strategy, there is a strategic change that's going to happen, isn't it? So how can we manage it? How can we manage our employees and make them understand that this particular new strategy would be really beneficial, etc. Okay, folks? So all these things should be considered. No, that's basically all about the SAF model. This is a simple process, isn't it? Now, moving on to the next aspect. <clears throat> Let's talk about performance measurement, shall we? So folks, you have to have this understanding that performance management and performance measurement are two separate things. Okay, folks, performance management is, is, is concerned with, you know, how the organization get to, gets to its objective, okay, folks, by improving their performance or by managing their performance. However, performance measurement is more concerned with the measuring the uh, level of performance that we currently have, okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. One focus on managing performance to achieve objectives, whereas the other is about measuring the level of performance within the organization. And how do we do that? Let's take a look, shall we? So we know that the senior management defines the objectives, the, uh, you know, one second, <clears throat> I'm just going to move this somewhere. There we go. So they define the objectives, they set strategies, they formulate uh, the strategy as well. Sorry, set targets and then formulate the strategy. This is what the senior management does, isn't it? And then what they do is they compare the budget versus actual, isn't it? So this is basically the uh, performance measurement activities. Okay, folks, they may have budgeted something. And now what they're going to do is they're going to compare this with the actual performance. And after that, they find some sort of deviation. So if they have found some sort of deviation, then they conduct an analysis and interpret why that particular deviation has occurred. And finally, they take the corrective action. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. So performance measurement is more concerned with the controlling set of activities, isn't it? So that's basically a really key, important point to remember here. Now, moving on to the next aspect, we have SWOT analysis, isn't it? So this is yet again another uh, really familiar model, isn't it? So in SWOT analysis, what all things do we look at? We look at the strength, weakness, opportunities as well as threats as well, isn't it? So to provide a summarized analysis of the company's present situation is the purpose of SWOT analysis. It can also be used to identify CSFs, which is critical success factors, as well as KPIs as well. Now, moving on. So as, you all, as we all know, the internal aspects, okay, folks, so strengths and weaknesses are basically the internal aspects or is something that we look for internally within the organization, whereas opportunities and threats are something that we look at in the external environment. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. That's a really important point. And moving on to a really common, I would say, analysis that you know, everyone thinks of once they, you know, once everyone mentioned the word model, or if, if, if you if you are, you know, uh, if you're asked for the business model, the first set of, you know, the first model that could come up in your mind would basically be pest analysis, isn't it? The best, mo the pest mo pestle model, isn't it? So what exactly are we looking at here? So the pestle model analyzes the macroeconomic environment. Okay, folks, what do we do here? We are analyzing the macroeconomic environment by taking a look at various factors. So what are these factors? Let's take a look. The PEST model looks at macroeconomic environment and its influence on organizational performance using the following headings. Let's take a look. We look at the political factors, isn't it? So political factors is more concerned with taxation policy, government stability, 
foreign trade regulations, taxation, employment law, envi uh, environmental protection legislation, etc. Okay, so all these things come under political factors. And then there are economical factors as well. Uh, interest rate, inflation, business cycles, unemployment, all these things come under economic factors as well. And I would also say that unemployment can also come under the social factors as well. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at the social factors. In social factors, we have population demographics, social mobility, income distribution, lifestyle changes, attitude of work, level of education and consumerism, etc. And finally, we have the technological factors, which is the speed of technological transfer and the rate of obsolescence as well. Okay, folks, so these are basically the factors that we have, we have to look for when conducting a pest analysis. Usually in your exam, a, pest, a particular analysis such as these would already be provided to you. And what you have to do is you will have to interpret the information within that particular, uh, you know, analysis and then comment on the scenario. Okay, folks, so th th that would be the kind of, you know, scenario that would be attested. Uh, in, in, in your APM exam. Okay, folks, rather than, you know, you won't be asked to apply the pestel model or anything much. Okay, folks, there are chances that there could be, but, you know, uh, the chances are uh, a bit low on that side. Because, you know, this is not the HBLI exam, this is more the, of the APM exam, isn't it? So that's basically the reason why. Now, always remember, guys, whenever you're applying a model, think of how you can improve the performance. Okay, folks, think of performance management. That's basically a key thing to remember here. Now, moving on to the Porter's five force model. So we have five forces that influence uh, a particular industry, isn't it? So what are these five forces as per Porter? Let's take a look at that. First of all, there is the uh, <clears throat> threat of new entrants, isn't it? If a particular new uh, competitor enters into the market, then that can influence the uh, overall industry. And of course, uh, there's the threat of new substitutes for our own product. That's basically a really, uh, you know, great threat, isn't it? Because you know, we might lose out on revenue since our customers are moving towards that particular sus substitute rather than our own product. And of course, there is the bargaining power of suppliers and bargaining power of customers as well. And finally, there is competitive rivalry as well. Okay, folks, so these are basically the five factors that influence our standing, our, our particular, our, uh, an organization standing within the industry. Okay, folks, so that's basically the uh, idea here. And then we also learned about Porter's diamond as well, isn't it? So this is more concerned with, uh, you know, conducting an analysis on the, on a particular, uh, you know, a nation's market or, you know, something like that. Okay, folks, uh, on a, a particular jurisdiction or so. So what we're going to look at, look at is there are, you know, we're going to look at four factors here, which is, you know, kind of, you know, picturized as a diamond here. So we will be looking at firm strategy. We will be looking at demand conditions related and supporting activities as well as factor conditions okay folks so these are some of the factors that influence a particular organization standing within a particular nation or uh, economic environment okay folks so that's basically the uh, idea behind Porter's diamond and then we move on to another matrix which is the bcg the boston consulting groups matrix uh, so what is the idea here guys this is like a, a matrix isn't it so therefore obviously there will be two factors that we should primarily uh, consider here First factor is the relative market share, and then we have the related market growth as well. Okay, folks. So if a particular, so it's all about, this is all about categorizing certain investment that the company has. Okay, folks. For example, let's say the organization has four products. Okay, folks. And product A, B, and C. Let's name it product A, B, and C. If product A has high relative market share and a high relative market growth, then we can call product A as a star investment. Okay, folks. However, if the, uh, if let's say product B has low market share, however, it has high market growth, then we can call it as a question mark. Okay, folks. And then if product C has low market growth and high market share, then we can call it as a cash cow. And finally, if product D has low market growth and low market share, then we call it as a dog investment. Okay, folks, so it's basically categorizing investment to understand what kind of an investment it is, or does it have a great deal of market share or market growth? Okay, folks, that's basically what, as to what the BCG matrix is useful, just to categorize investment so that we can talk about another course of action. Okay, folks, for example, for star investments, it'll succeed, isn't it? So we just have to take, you know, a bit, you know, less efforts in order to improve that particular product it's not that we shouldn't just leave it be we should you know take take initiatives in order to make sure that that particular 
product remains a star investment. And then uh, another product for question mark, we're actually confused as to what to do because you know there's a, a really great growth potential. However, there's not much market share, isn't it? So maybe we should invest more on the marketing side of things or so. So, so that's basically something that we should determine. And of course, there is the cash cow, which is, you know, even though the market is, you know, growing slow, we, uh, it, we have a lot of market share there. So we will be generating income. However, can we promote growth? Or our focus should be to promote the growth for this particular set of investment to make it a star investment. And finally, there is the dog, where is, you know, which are basically investment we usually either ignore or take, uh, you know, uh, we plan on uh, shut up, shutting it down in the future or so, unless if we can, you know, do some improvements to uh, increase their market growth or market share. That's basically as to what dog investments are. And that's basically as to what the BCG matrix is all about as well. Now, moving on to the next aspect, we have Porter's generic strategies. So what are, what are these? These are basically the three generic strategies uh, that are identified by Porter through which an organization could achieve a competitive advantage and optimize their performance. How do we get competitive advantage? First of all, there is cost leadership. Okay, folks, so we can be a cost leader. If we reduce the cost to the maximum extent, or I would say to a reasonable extent, if it's, you know, reduced to the maximum extent, then there's a chance that we will be uh, you know, sacrificing the quality as well. And so let's say if we are reducing cost to a reasonable extent that all the all the other uh, competitors within the industry, then we can, you know, increase our profit margin as well as, you know, be become more profitable and increase our market share, etc. Okay, folks, that's basically the thing. So uh, this, this can be done by using common processes and parts. Uh, by achieving economies of scale. What is economies of scale? When we are producing, uh, you know, on a large scale, there would be some profitability advantages, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Uh, as we, you know, produce more or when we are producing large scale, the cost would reduce. That's basically the idea here behind economies of scale. And then there is automation to a certain extent as well. Okay, folks, if, we, if there is automation, then, uh, you know, to a certain extent, we would be able to reduce the cost to a certain level. Okay, folks, that's basically the thing. However, you know, there is, there is a, you know, I'm talking about the labor cost. If you, okay, folks, so we could reduce labor cost to a certain extent. Now, uh, another aspect is basically differentiation. So what the idea here is about making a product that is uh, a bit more, uh, that can stand out a bit more than our competitor. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. So it's not always about the quality. But, you know, the ease of use and buying, etc. It could be anything. Okay, folks, it could even be the packaging of things or, uh, you know, the delivery of things, etc. Okay, folks, it can be anything, anything that uh, that has differentiation. For example, as of now, all the deliveries are, you know, can, uh, all the deliveries through various websites such as Amazon or Flipkart are conducted through various courier services, etc. Isn't it? However, what if I start a business? Which, uh, where the delivery is, uh, is conducted by drones or something. Okay, folks, if that is the case, then I'm, I'm a bit more differentiated in the market. And if my service is good, then, you know, I'll get more customers, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. And then there is also an aspect known as focus differentiation as well. And this is basically, uh, you know, it's, it's basically all about focusing on one particular market segment and trying to, you know, dominate that particular segment. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And it might create a barrier to entry. Uh, and of course, it's suited for small companies. And it's kind of a bit difficult to grow in these kind of, if we are using this particular strategy, okay, folks, by focusing on one particular small uh, market segment. That's basically the idea here. Now, moving on to uh, another topic that is mission. Okay, folks, so now let's talk about mission statements, shall we? A mission statement outlines the broad direction that an organization will follow and summarizes the reason and values that underlies that organization. So basically, basically our objective is mentioned in a statement, okay, folks, in a, in a brief, memorable, enduring uh, statement, okay, folks? And what does enduring mean? Enduring basically means that the statement should not change unless the entity's mission changes. And of course, it can be addressed to a number of stakeholder groups, for example, shareholders, employees, and customers. And finally, it can be used as a guide for employees to work towards the accomplishment of, a, of the mission. Okay, folks, so these are basically some of the characteristics of how a mission statement should be. Now, moving on to another aspect that is CSFs and KPIs. So what's the idea here, guys? In order to achieve the organizational objectives, we have to excel in some critical areas. Okay, folks? So these critical areas are known as critical success factors. 
Now, how do we measure or how do we know that as to whether we have excelled in these areas? In order to measure the extent to which we have excelled in the critical success factors, we determine key performance indicators or KPIs. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea behind CSFs and KPIs to put it very briefly. And then we, we can also look at another really interesting topic known as benchmarking as well. So what is the uh, what is benchmarking all about? Benchmarking is basically the process of identifying best practices in relation to the products or services and the processes by which those products or services are created and delivered. Okay, folks, what we do is we compare our organization's performance or you know KPIs and various other aspects with uh, an external organization or, or the best organization in the industry. That's basically as what benchmarking is all about. Now, moving on to the next aspect, what, what, what is the benchmarking process all about? Let's take a look. So as part of the benchmarking process, what we do is we set objectives and decide the critical areas. We identify KPIs and the driving factors of these KPIs. And then we identify the benchmark from the industry or within the organization. There are different types of benchmarking, isn't it? So there are there is internal benchmarking, there is external benchmarking, competitor benchmarking, uh, or in other words, uh, you know, activity or strategy benchmarking. There are different types of benchmarking, okay, folks. So what we have to do here is we uh, the first step is basically to set our objective. What is our objective here? Let's first of all understand that, and then we, let's set our uh, set our KPIs and let's find out an organization which can uh, you know which uh, which can which is kind of similar to our organization's objective uh, or it has similar kpis etc and after that what we do is we measure the performance of that particular uh, organization i'm just going to adjust a few things here there we go all right so we identify the benchmark and then we measure performance and after measuring performance, we compare that particular performance with the benchmark. And after that, if there is any sort of deviations or improvements that needs to be made, then we specify those improvements. And finally, we implement and monitor the improvements. So these are basically the step-by-step -step process by which the benchmarking process is conducted. As simple as that. Okay, folks? Kind of a straightforward process if you ask me. Now. After benchmarking, let's move on to another really interesting area known as budgeting. Okay, folks, so budgeting is like a common process or a common thing that we learn in performance management as well, isn't it? So let's take up, let's talk about that. So when we talk about budgeting, what are we doing here? We're just setting targets so that the people in or individuals within the organization can achieve them, isn't it? So that's basically the sim uh, a simple and straightforward process. And budgeting is as part of the planning and controlling process. Okay, folks, so we're planning things, okay, folks? by setting targets, isn't it? And of course, uh, we're comparing the planned performance with the actual performance to identify deviation. And this, therefore, this particular process is also useful or budgeting is also useful for controlling purposes as well. Okay, folks. And when we talk about budgeting, there are different types of budgeting. And of course, in the APM exam, you may be given a scenario and you may be asked to, uh, you know, uh, comment on the budgeting process that is currently used by the organization. Point out the advantages, the disadvantages, etc. Okay, folks, so remember that. Now, if such a situation arises, you will have to have an understanding of the uh, budgeting process, isn't it? So let's take a look at the first type, that is incremental budgeting, which is the you know normal budgeting process, isn't it? So let's take a look. This is a budgeting method in which each year, sorry, in which next year's budget is prepared by using the current year's actual results as a starting point and make adjustments for expected inflation, sales growth, or decline, and other known changes. So what's the idea here, guys? So in incremental budgeting, we're preparing the budget for the next year based on some adjustment. Okay, well, we, may, we may just make some adjustment to some, uh, you know, figures in, in, in relation to aspects such as inflation or due to some, due, based on certain expectations for the next year, etc. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And of course, this is the traditional approach to budgeting. It's a simple and straightforward process, isn't it? However, the problem is that, uh, yeah, and of course, uh, there's a reasonable procedure if the current operations are effective. Okay, folks, if, if, you, if your organization is operating in a stable environment, Okay, folks, if, you're, if your you know, business environment is stable, then incremental budgeting would be appropriate. However, this cannot be used for an organization in a rapidly changing environment. Okay, folks, that's a really important factor to consider here. And another disadvantage here is that 
inefficiencies from budgeting as it as it encourages slack and wasteful spending. So what's the idea here, guys? So if there are inefficiencies in the current year, when preparing the budget for the next year, what are we doing here? Which is, you know, adding a few values here and there based on the current year's budget, isn't it? That's basically it. So what's going to happen is we're going to carry forward the inefficiencies from the current year to the next year. Okay, folks, that is one of the disadvantages of incremental budgeting. Now, moving on to the, uh, let's take a quick look at the advantages and disadvantages of this. Advantages is that it's quick and easy and suitable for organizations that operate in a stable environment with historical, uh, where historical results are reliable. And of course, the disadvantage is that uh, build, it builds in previous problems and inefficiencies, as I've stated earlier, and manager may spend more time to ensure that they get the same level next year, as in, you know, there won't be, they won't be motivated in order to, uh, you know, create efficiencies, isn't it? So they, they, their objective would solely be Let's achieve, uh, you know, the results that we, we plan to achieve. That's basically all there is to it. Okay, folks, uh, there won't be any efficiencies or anything like that, or there won't be any removal of inefficiencies as well. Now, moving on to the next uh, type of budgeting, that is zero-based budgeting. Let's talk about this, shall we? This involves preparing a budget for each cost center or activity from zero or scratch base. Every time, expend every item of expenditure has to be justified in its entirety in order to be included in the next year's budget. So what's the idea behind zero-based budgeting, guys? We are not going to carry forward any inefficiencies within the prior year. We're going to start everything from scratch or from zero. Okay, folks, that's basically what uh, zero-based budgeting is all about. Now, uh, what are the advantages of this? Well, it identifies and removes any inefficient and obsolete operation. <clears throat> True statement, isn't it? We don't carry forward any inefficiencies, so these will be eliminated. And it forces employees to avoid any wasteful, wasteful expenses. Because the idea here is that since we are starting everything from scratch, if any item needs to be or any item of expenditure needs to be included within the budget, then they would have to justify why we need it. Okay, folks? So it forces employees to avoid wasteful spending, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. And it promotes a culture of efficiency and it responds to changes to a certain extent quickly. And of course, uh, you know, provides an in-depth appraisal of the organization's operations. And finally, it's more, uh, you know, efficient. Uh, there's more efficient allocation of resources within the organization, thanks to this particular zero-based budgeting as well. Okay, folks, and what would the disadvantages be? Obviously, we're starting everything from scratch, so it's going to be time-consuming, isn't it? So there's that, and what else? Short-term benefits might be emphasized to determine... Uh, to the detriment of long-term benefits. So the idea here is that, you know, for if you're talking about short-term investments, these would, these would be, you know, cheaper than, or comparatively, the cost would be a bit less than long-term investments, isn't it? So the idea here is that if we find some uh, some investments to be too big or too huge, then we, we would much rather, you know, push it to the next year or so. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So it doesn't necessarily promote long-term investment. That's basically a disadvantage and what else? It gives an impression that all decisions have to be made in the budget and it may require management skills, obviously. Information systems are not capable of uh, providing suitable information. So the idea here is that the first aspect is that it gives an impression that all decisions have to be made in the budget. So the idea here is that, you know, due to this you know, justification aspect of certain items to be included, it basically says that, you know, whether it be long term investment, whether it be short term investment, the decision have to be made at the time of creating the budget itself. Okay, folks, we don't we don't have much time to think about it if we're creating the budget. So let's just, you know, uh, quickly think of the, uh, you know, quickly think of an idea and then, you know, just go ahead with it. That's basically the thing. Okay, folks, though, there's not much time to think on a particular, there, there's not much time taken to discuss a particular decision to include or not. Okay, folks, in certain instances. And of course, it requires a great deal of, you know, uh, manage it, management skills because what we're going to do is we're going to rank some of the decision packages in order of priority or in order of, uh, you know, whatever is more uh, suitable or more profitable for the organization, etc. Uh, so this this ranking system is based on judgment, isn't it? Managerial judgment. That's basically what has been mentioned here. And of course, information systems uh, within the organization may not be capable of providing you know, suitable information uh, in order to conduct zero-based budgeting. Okay, folks, that's basically a possibility as well. 
and of course yeah the ranking process of decision packages can be difficult and of course it requires a lot of time and effort as well okay folks that's basically the you know most obvious uh, disadvantage we could think of isn't it now what else that's not the only type of budgeting isn't it we also have rolling budgets as well and what's the idea behind rolling budgets this is a budget which is continuously updated by adding a further accounting period or a month or a quarter at the end of the budget when the earliest period in the current budget has ended as a result a number of rolling budgets are prepared each year and each rolling budget covers the next uh, 12 months so the idea here is that after the end of each and every month or quarter what we're going to do is we, we will revise the budget based on the actual results that has happened in the re most recent quarter or month okay folks so that's basically the idea here and these are also known as continuous budgets as well and obviously it will be more suitable for rapidly changing industries isn't it so that's, there's that so what are the advantages it reduces the element of uncertainty to a certain extent of course there would still be uncertainty because we can't predict what's going to happen in the future isn't it however it can since we're continuously updating the budget the budgets would be a bit more realistic okay folks and of course uh, you know there's a reduced level of uncertainty and manage uh, for it can it forces managers to reassess the budget regularly and it will be more the budgets would be more realistic and achievable to a certain extent isn't it and realistic budgets are likely to have better motivational influence on employees as well so dis disadvantages would be that it requires more time effort and money and off-putting effect on managers who doubt the value of preparing one budget after the uh, after another after another at a regular basis so it might demotivate managers who think that you know why exactly are we preparing budgets on a regular basis why can't just we stick to one particular thing isn't it so that's basically uh, another disadvantage and of course there is a large administrative effort required here because you know we're continuously updating budgets and therefore we continuously require the appropriate level of information to create the budget as well isn't it and of course cost may exceed benefits if the rate of change in business environment is not rapid and continuous as well okay folks it's solely suitable for an organization that that is in a rapidly changing environment now then we have activity based budgets or abb as well it's kind of similar to abc what we do is uh, for each item that is to be included in the budget we take a look at the driving factors okay folks, driving factors of cost that's basically the idea here so this type of budget involves defining the activities that underlie the financial figures in each function and use the level of activity to decide how much resource should be allocated and how well it is being managed and to explain variances from the budget okay folks so we look at the driving factors of each item to be included within the budget that's basically the idea here okay folks and it's more suited for uh, you know complex organizations that's another point to add as well now what are the principles of abb let's take a look at that so key activities that uh, account for overhead spending are identified and then the budget budgeted cost will be depend upon the expected level of activity and its activities that drives cost and uh, drives cost and the aim is to plan and control the cost of cost of cost rather than the cost themselves okay folks we will be looking at the drivers isn't it that's basically what has been mentioned here and the benefit of this is that critical success factors will be identified and of course uh, you know there are, there is uh, you know more chance of getting it right the first time as well okay folks so since we are you know, looking at the driving factors and uh, determining what causes the cause we will be able to identify the critical areas that we have to excel in and of course uh, you know if we conduct this process appropriately then you know we, we get everything right the first time okay folks we won't be you know learning from our mistakes in the future because there won't be any mistakes the first time isn't it so that's basically the time okay folks however you know at this point it's not that it, it's not guaranteed that everything would be right in the first time it's just that there would be more you know chance of that being truth okay folks and remember guys abb abb is more suitable for complex organizations okay folks Nick, keep this in mind then we talk about criticisms of budgeting so what are the criticisms of budgeting it's basically the fact that they are time consuming and expensive to a certain extent isn't it and of course they are too rigid and prevent fast response okay folks even for rolling budgets the idea is, is that you know to a certain extent it is too uh, a bit too fixed isn't it so if there is a uh, let's say a change in the industry let's say in the next week then we can only change the budget after, after if most probably the next month or if we are talking about incremental budgeting even if there is some sort of change a slight change in the industry we cannot respond as fast as we we would think isn't it? so that's basically one of the uh, another criticism that we have because you know we would be following a set 
uh, path or the, uh, we will be just following the the plan that we have fixed upon isn't it so that's basically the idea here and after any ch if any change comes within the industry then responding to it would be a bit of a you know slow process okay folks that's basically the idea here and of course they protect rather than reduce cost if we have budgeted for a particular set of costs then we would much rather try to you know stick to that level of cost rather than reduce it isn't it so that's basically what is meant here and main focus on the sales targets rather than customer satisfaction so we are only looking at the financial aspects of things here we're not looking at the known financial aspects such as customer satisfaction or anything okay folks that's basically the idea here and finally we also learn a concept known as beyond budgeting which is you know a bit uh, something that's beyond the budgeting process isn't it so let's talk about that shall we this concept foils the whole idea of budgeting because it it it, it proposes the idea that traditional budgeting should be abandoned and instead what we're going to do is we're going to look at FOIL. What is FOIL? F stands for freedom for the management to make their own decisions. The books provide autonomy to the management and O stands for organizational benefit managers focus towards the customers and the organization okay folks rather than the you know financial figures itself and of course i stands for information system there should be a fast and easily accessible information system for beyond budgeting to be successful and finally l stands for long term view okay folks so management should focus on the present and the future as well not just the short term the long term okay folks that's basically the idea here so by uh these are basically some of the features of beyond budgeting and of course yeah it, it basically follows the traditional approach to budgeting such as you know the incremental budgets etc okay folks and what else now in order to do this you will need resources that should be available on demand and uh, to take advantage of the opportunities okay folks of course without you know resources such as a good information system or a, a set of skill managers we won't be able to uh, adapt adopt this particular beyond budgeting concept to an organization isn't it so that's basically the idea here okay folks now moving on so what are the benefits and cha challenges of beyond budgeting the benefits are that there is a shift of focus isn't it so from you know short term to long term and then there is more motivation uh for the you know managers since they are you know they can make their own decisions etc and of course there is a far faster response to the threats and opportunities we're not following a rigid approach here you know we're not following a rigid plan here so we're just you know acting according to the uh you know uh, changes that has happened in the industry or environment isn't it so that's basically the idea here this faster response but the challenge here is that there would be a resistance to change okay folks the employees might resist uh you know changing from the conventional the traditional method to budgeting to beyond budgeting since it's a new technique obviously whenever a change comes if everyone would be a bit frightened as to whether they would be uh, you know able to become compatible with it or not isn't it so that's that's basically the same situation here and finally resource constraints are there as well okay folks if we don't have the sufficient level of resources then you know we cannot implement beyond budgeting within the organization that's basically yeah straightforward uh i would say point isn't it that's basically it okay folks so that's basically all for the budgeting related concepts now let's move uh, let's move to a bit more interesting set of concepts as well such as business process reengineering or bpr okay folks so what is bpr all about bpr is the fundamental re rethinking and radical redesign of business processes to achieve dramatic improvements in critical contemporary measures of performance such as cost speed service and quality the primary aim is to improve customer satisfaction. So, when it comes to business process reengineering, what are we doing here? We are taking a look at the current processes, and let's say that we've identified some sort of inefficiencies. So, what we're going to do is we're going to redesign the whole process so that we can achieve efficiency and we can, uh, you know, promote customer satisfaction to a certain extent as well. Okay, folks. So that's basically what BPR is all about. Straightforward process, isn't it? And then we learn another term known as business integration as well. So, what is business integration? Business integration is an important aspect of a business. Uh, business integration means that all aspects of the business must be aligned to secure the most efficient use of organization's resources so that it can achieve its ob uh, objective effectively. What's the idea here, guys? We are just going to you know, plan on using our resources in the most efficient manner so that we can achieve the objective effect effectively. That's basically all there is to it. Okay, folks. So in, in your exam, there is there could possibly be a question where you will be provided with a scenario where the, uh, the, where the uh, you know, process and, and systems within the organization would be well explained. And you would have to, uh, you know, 
uh, point out as to whether BPR or business integration is possible within the organization or not as well. Okay, folks, it's just common sense. Okay, folks, you just have to use common sense in most of the APM questions that come up in your exam. Now, moving on to the next aspect, let's talk about Porter's value chain, shall we? So what's the idea here, guys? Uh, the Porter's value chain is based on activities conducted within the organization. So value a value chain considers the organization's activities that create value and drives cost and therefore the organization should focus on improving those activities. Okay, folks, so the primary objective here is to improve the value adding activities within the organization. Okay, folks, and the activities are split into primary uh, value activities and secondary or support value activities which are necessary to support the primary activities as well. Okay, folks, so there are two sets of activities, primary and secondary. And primary, uh, secondary activities are basically, uh, you know, activities which supports the primary activities, as simple as that. Now, let's take a look at the diagram, shall we? So as you can see here, we have the primary activities that is inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, which is basically, you know, inbound logistics are basically acquisition of, you know, raw materials, etc. Operation is the process of converting these inputs into outputs and outbound logistics is basically all about, you know, delivering the particular output or storing them in warehouses, etc. Then there is marketing and sales as well. This is kind of a straightforward thing, isn't it? So remember that. And of course, finally, there is services or in other words, after sale services as well. Okay, folks, so these are basically the primary activities. And what are the secondary activities that supports this? There is the firm's infrastructure. Okay, folks, if we don't have a warehouse to store goods, then where would, where would we store our goods, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. Okay, folks, we have warehouse infrastructure to support the primary activity. We have a human resource management. We need to have a certain level of people to conduct the primary activities. Technological developments, we need to have the appropriate level of systems and technology in order to conduct these activities. And finally, there is procurement as well. Okay, folks, we need to procure the most, uh, you know, quality goods from the appropriate per person. Okay, folks, it's not just raw materials or anything. It's also capital assets as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the thing. We should procure the right things so that we can conduct our primary activities appropriately. So that's basically as to what the value chain uh, analysis is all about. So the idea here is to remove all the non-value adding activities and only focus on the value adding activities here. Okay, folks, as simple as that. Now, Moving on to the McKenzie's 7S model. So what is the McKenzie's 7S model all about? Let's take a look. The McKenzie's 7S model describes the organization as consisting of seven interrelated internal elements. A change in one element will affect the others. All several elements will be aligned to ensure organizational success. So it basically talks about seven interrelated elements, isn't it? So what are these elements? I have the diagram right here. We have shared values, we have structure, system, style, staff, skills, and uh, strategy as well, isn't it? So these are basically the seven interrelated items which can help the organization, isn't it? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, which can help the organization to achieve its objectives and successes in it. So that's basically the idea here. So if, if we align these things appropriately, then there would be efficiency within the organization. That's basically the idea behind McKenzie's 7S model. And please, uh, please go through that because, you know, there could be scenarios where you will have to apply these models as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, moving on to a bit more environmental set of topics, such as integrated reporting. First of all, let's talk about that. An integrated report is a concise communication about how an organization's strategy, performance, governance, and prospects lead to the creation of value over the short, medium, and long term. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what integrated reporting is. And it's basically to put it into uh, simple terms, it's all about the financial information as well as the non-financial information and environmental and social and you know corporate responsibility, etc. All these aspects are integrated into a single report. That's basically the idea here. And it's basically to, you know, report to the particular investors and other stakeholders as to how we add value or how we create value over the long term, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Now, when we talk about integrated report, there are uh, six capitals identified by the International Integrated Report Council, which is, you know, the key factors influencing a particular integrated report or key factors on which the integrated report must report on. So what are these capitals? Let's take a look. First of all, there is the financial capital. Okay, folks. So this is obtained through financing such as shares, bonds, and bank notes. It enables the other type of capital described below to be owned and 
traded. So this is basically as to what financial capital is, isn't it? That's basically it. Okay, books, shares, bonds, etc. So how exactly are we creating value using this particular capital? That's something that we can report. And what else? There is the manufactured capital. What are manufactured capital? This form of capital can be described as comprising of material goods or fixed assets that contribute to the production process rather than being output itself. For example, tools, machines, and buildings. So these are basically items that we use to help out in the manufacturing process, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. And uh, yeah, manufactured capital is often created by other organizations. Of course, we may not you know, produce the tools, isn't it? We buy them from another organization, isn't it? That's basically the idea here. Then there is intellectual capital, such as copyrights, patents, software licenses, uh, employee knowledge, brand reputation, etc. And then there are also human capital as well. And this can be described as consisting of people's health, knowledge, skills, and motivation. And all these things are needed for productive work as well. It's a true statement, isn't it? So we use human capital for these purposes. And then there is social and relationship capital as well. So uh, in social and relationship capital, we talk about the business relationship or contractual relationship that we have with certain institutions or organizations, etc. So this can be described as being concerned with institutions that help maintain and develop human capital in partnership with others. For example, families, communities, business, trade unions, schools, and voluntary organizations such as share and uh, share norms, uh, common values, and behaviors, etc. For example, a huge corporate that I work in may have some relation with a educational institution to provide us with some, you know, courses, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. For example, some organizations may have uh, some contracts with, uh, you know, websites like Udemy or uh, Skillsoft, etc., to provide. Uh, their services to uh, at a discounted price or for free, isn't it? So that's basically the idea mentioned here. And then we have natural capital as well. These are all, uh, these involve renewable and non-renewable environmental resources and processes that provide goods and services that support past, current and future prosperity of the organization. So that's basically as to what natural capital is all about. So it's basically all about the natural resources or environmental resources, which are both renewable as well as non uh, renewable as well, isn't it? And we know that we have to use it in a sustainable manner. What is sustainable or sustainability all about? It's all about utilizing resources in such a way that we don't compromise or we don't, you know, uh, overutilize it so that uh, the future generation can enjoy these same resources as well, isn't it? So that's basically the idea behind sustainability. Now, Moving on to the next aspect, this can be de described as any stock or flow of energy and material within the environment that produces goods or services. That's basically it. Okay, folks, flow of energy, materials, etc. Uh, and finally, it includes land, water, energy, and factors that absorb, neutralize, or recycle waste and processes. For example, climate regulation, climate change, CO2 emissions, etc. So all these commander the natural capital okay folks so that's basically all about the six capital that influence the uh, or uh, that which we have to focus on to make sure that we are adding value or creating value for the organization isn't it so that's basically the idea here now moving on to the next aspect we have corporate social responsibility which is kind of a easy concept which you may have learned in several other papers as well isn't it so the idea here is that a company should be sensitive to the needs of all stakeholders in its business operations and not just shareholders is known as corporate social responsibility. Ethics is just one dimension of corporate social responsibility. The terminology of CSR uh, was developed prior to ESG. ESG is basically uh, uh, environmental, social and governance related aspects. Okay, folks, and is beginning to be superseded and replaced by the use of uh, ESG. So. Uh, basically, you know, instead of CSR, we're fo more fo focusing more on ESG related aspects. Okay, folks, so ESG is more focused on it again, social, uh, social, uh, you know, responsibility related aspects. But uh, at the same time, we're also focusing on the governance policy. Are we, uh, you know, are the organizations complying with corporate governance regulations or, uh, you know, are we compliant with environmental regulations? All these things would uh, be focused on when it comes to the concept of ESG here. Okay, folks. Now, moving on to another aspect. So how can we empower the employees within the organization? Because whatever decision that we take, there is a uh, an impact on the employees as well, isn't it? Their staff morale might increase or decrease, isn't it? So how can we empower them? Let's talk about that, shall we? The employees in an organization should be empowered for the uh, by the following methods, okay? So they can, uh, they require targeted and relevant information. 
So if they are informed about everything, then they would be a bit more motivated, isn't it? So provide them with the target and relevant uh, information. Okay, folks, that's basically it. And then we can provide them with feedback of their work. Of course, there are two sides to it, isn't it? Some people can take feedback negatively, whereas others take it positively, isn't it? So let's just focus on the positive aspect here, shall we? So we can empower employees by making them understand where they went wrong and, you know, uh, provide them guidance to improve or improve themselves. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And of course, we can also provide them with financial as well as non-financial information just so that they can understand where they have reached, isn't it? So uh, is their work, uh, you know, providing results for the organization or are they helping the organization achieving the objectives? That's basically something that we can, uh, you know, uh, inform the employees about uh, by providing financial as well as non-financial information. And of course, communication of responsibility with clarity as well. So we should, uh, whenever we are allocating responsibility to employees, we should clearly mention what they're supposed to do. Okay, folks, that's basically another way to empower them and of course finally the cost and benefit of such information must also be considered of course if we are providing information uh, or if, if we are you know talking about information itself it, the gathering information is quite uh, you know a, a, a cost effect a costly process isn't it in a way you know there would be some uh, you know cost in relation to collection of data processing of data etc so we should compare these particular costs with the benefits of uh, you know using the information or providing the information to employees and then make an ultimate decision okay folks so that's basically the idea here now moving on to another matrix that is the mendelos matrix so let's take a look at that shall we so the mendelos matrix looks at the level of power and level of interest of different stakeholder groups and it is also known as the stakeholder mapping matrix as well now uh, it helps to manage stakeholder conflict demands, con conflicting demands, and to establish its priorities in terms of managing stakeholders' expectations and managers. So what's the idea here, guys? We're just prioritizing, or we use this particular matrix to prioritize the stakeholders, and uh, you know, prioritize which stakeholders should be, uh, you know, uh, kept happy, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. So we have the model right here. So what's the idea here, guys? But there are two aspects that we focus on. One is the level of power and the other is the level of interest. If the level of power and interest is high, then we call them the key players of the organization. Isn't it? So they should always be kept, uh, they should always be you know, given priority. And then there is, the, if the particular stakeholders level of interest is low, however, the power is high, such as, you know, the government, etc., then we keep them satisfied. Okay, folks, we keep them happy. That's basically it. I don't have to uh, focus too much on them like what we would do, or we don't have to prioritize them as, uh, you know, highly as what we would have done for a key player. However, we should, we should still keep them satisfied. And then there are people who does not have power. The power is low. However, the level of interest is high. For them, we just keep them informed of our various decisions and aspects of the organization. And finally, we have minimal effort or stakeholder group to which we should just have to take some minimal effort. Why? Because they don't have the power nor the interest, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. So we're using this particular matrix, we can prioritize the stakeholders of an organization, isn't it? So kind of a straightforward uh, matrix, I would say. Now, moving on to some organizational structures. So uh, why exactly are we learning this? Well, basically in the scenario, the organization might be following a particular structure. They may, they may be using terminologies like functional structure or divisional structure. And as a professional accountant, you will have to understand what they mean, isn't it? So that's basically why we had to learn these terms. So first of all, let's focus on the first aspect that is functional structure. In a functional structure, the organization is divided on the basis of activities or functions like production, marketing, accounting, and finance, etc. Employees that undertake similar tasks will be grouped together into these departments. So what's the idea here, guys? The, the department is or the categorization within the organization is based on the activities or functions such as uh, production, marketing, accounting, finance, HR, etc. Isn't it? So that's basically the thing. And then we also have a divisional structure. And this is where the categorization is based on product lines. What is it? So that's basically the case. Okay, folks, in a divisional structure, the organization is divided into several autonomous divisions. The key term here is autonomous division because each division will have their own you know, power to take decision. That's why. And that oversees a product or a geographical region. It could be based on product line or it could be based on geographical region or any other uh, you know, basis of categorization as well. Okay, folks. And this division can also be known as SBUs or strategic business units as well. 
Then we move on to the next aspect that is network or virtual structures and which is, this is like the you know modern form of structures and you know, modern form of businesses isn't it so network structure occurs when a when an organization outsources many of its uh, functions to other organizations and simply exists as a network of contracts with very few if any functions being kept in house so the idea here is that the majority of the functions are outsourced to several other third party organizations and we only focus on some core functions that's basically the idea here these organizations have little to no physical premises and employees and managers work remotely and reconnected to uh, using IT such as email, video conferencing, intranet, etc. And suppliers and customers are linked using IT systems. The organization appears to the outside world to be just like any traditional organization. So to the outside world, it's just an organization, but on the inside, this particular organization may not you know may not have a physical existence okay folks they may have like a few offices uh, one particular office or so that's basically it however the majority of the functions are outsourced to third party organizations okay folks however i would much rather see that this particular uh, aspect is just a phase okay folks it's a, it's a phase that a particular organization goes through once they you know grow their business to let's say millions and millions worth of dollars then uh, they could have, you know, multiple offices in different, uh, you know, geographical locations, etc. So that's basically the case. Okay, folks, so this is a type of business, but, uh, you know, once the business grows, the chances are they would, you know, uh, purchase various other, uh, you know, physical assets such as buildings, offices, head offices, etc. Okay, folks, so uh, just to point that out. Now, uh, moving on to the next aspect. Now, let's talk about risk and uncertainty, shall we? So when it comes to risk and uncertainty, what, what exactly is the difference here? Future events cannot be predicted accurately by strategic planning deals with future events. Sorry, uh, but strategic planning deals with future events. So what is strategic planning? Planning for the future, isn't it? So definitely we would have to predict the future to a certain extent, even if it's not uh, that accurate or 100% accurate, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. Okay, folks. So therefore, planning must take risk and uncertainty into account. Okay, so what exactly? Uh, is this risk and uncertainty all about? Let's take a look at that, shall we? Risk is a number of possible outcomes and the probability of each outcome is known. What's the idea here, guys? We can uh, we can uh, point out or we can, uh, we can identify a number of possible outcomes and of course, the probability of each of these outcomes will be known to us. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea behind uh, risk. So what, what about uncertainty? So the difference in uncertainty is that we won't be able to, you know, uh, we, don't, we won't be able to assign probability to any of the outcomes, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here, okay, folks? So uncertainty means that there are a number of possible outcomes. However, the probability of each outcome is not known, okay, folks? So that's basically the difference here. Now, let's talk about risk management because as an organization, we will have to identify, assess, and plan for how to deal with uh, risks that occur in the in, in the environment, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. Okay, folks. So the existence of exogenous variables leads to strategic planning will always uh, always be subject to risk and uncertainty. All business face risk or uncertainty. In the process of understanding, managing the risk uh, that an organization is inevitably subject to is known as risk management. So what do we do here, guys? We identify, assess, and plan for how to deal with that particular risk. And of course, finally, we also monitor as to whether the risk can, uh, as to whether you know we are managing the risk appropriately or not as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea behind risk management. Kind of a straightforward uh, process, I would say. Now, as you can see here, we have just uh, discussed this, isn't it? So we identify the risk, assess the risk, plan for the risk, and we monitor the entire process once again, just to make sure that we are doing everything appropriately. That's basically it. Okay, folks. So there are some basic tools that we use in risk and uncertainty, such as scenario planning. Scenario planning is all about, you know, creating a simulation of the, or, 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 or identifying all the possible outcomes and then, you know, planning uh, based on that particular thing. Okay, folks, based on the information that is being uh, made available to us. And then we have computer simulations as well, which this is basically, Assessing the uh, assessing all of the possible outcomes using uh, you know the computer systems. That's basically the idea here. And then we have sensitivity analysis, which is basically 
assessing the sensitivity of each and every variables or financial figures etc so that we can understand as to what the impact of a change in each of these key variables would be okay folks so that's basically what sensitivity analysis is all about and then we also learn about expected values as well which is like the average value or out, uh, average outcome isn't it in, in a way uh, and of course, finally, we also have the maximax, maximin, and minimax regret approaches as well. So all these things are really important. So keep on revising this because you could be tested in you know these sort of areas in the exam as well. Now, moving on to risk appetite. So we've learned about three types of risk appetites, isn't it? There is risk covers individuals who are you know not necessarily interested in taking risks. So what they do is they look for the you know maximum outcome or the or the best possible outcome with minimum risk okay folks so that's basically the idea here and of course there are risk seekers who are interested in taking risk for better returns isn't it so that's basically what risk seekers are and then there is risk neutral people as well and they stand in the middle of risk seeker and risk covers and uh, that is they either they neither avoid the risk nor they accept all of the risk as well maybe a little level of risk that's basically fine but not too low or too high okay folks so that's basically the idea behind risk neutral now moving on to expected values so what are expected values it's a weighted average value of the different possible outcomes from a decision where weightings are based on the probability of each possible outcome so for each possible outcome we assign the probability isn't it and we uh, you know multiply the outcome times the probability and we add all the uh, figures together isn't it so that's that's basically the formula for calculating expected value sigma p x right yeah p, p x now moving on uh, they indicate what an uh, what an outcome is likely to be in the long term if the decision can be repeated many times over many business transactions do occur over and over again so expected value is used for repeated decisions okay folks that's basically the idea here so can we use it for one-off decisions no not really isn't it so that's basically really important to keep in mind and yeah you can see the equation right here sigma p x where p is the probability of the outcome and x is the possible outcome okay folks and we you know add all of the all of the px of each outcome together isn't it so that's basically the thing and what exactly is the limitation of using expected value well it's a long run average so we cannot use it for one of decisions it may be a value that may never occur because it's an average figure isn't it so uh, it's not necessarily mandatory that the average figure might occur but you know uh, a figure maybe close to the average would occur uh, here and there isn't it so that's basically the thing and of course it, it ignores the extreme outcomes which is you know uh look focusing on the middle okay folks we're not we're not looking at the extreme outcomes anywhere okay folks that's basically another disadvantage of expected value model and yeah that's basically all about expected values and risk and uncertainty now let's talk about the role of management accountant in sustainability what is sustainability as i mentioned before it's all about using the resources in a responsible manner so that we don't uh, you know degrade or we don't uh, affect or impact the future generations uh, use of these resources in it so that's basically the idea here now uh, what exactly is the role of a management accountant in sustainability though because as we all know, management accountant rules has, you know, broadened over the years, isn't it? It used to be just creating budgets and forecasts. However, now we are more into strategic thinking and strategic decision making as well, isn't it? So that's basically the idea. Let's understand it, shall we? Management accountants will apply their skills and competencies to help develop sustainable strategies that are more forward looking about value creation and risk mitigation as well. And of course, uh, management accountant needs to ensure that resources allocated within the finance team and across the organization to manage um, uh, to engage in ESG issues. Management accountants will have a significant role in embedding uh, performance measures in the area of sustainability as well. Okay, folks. So what's the idea here, guys? They use their skill and competencies to make forward looking, uh, you know, uh, yeah, they're a bit more forward looking and they have to assess as to whether there is any, uh, you know, let's say environmental impact or environmental risks that are there with, uh, that the organization might face in the future and they have to take corrective action to it, towards it and they have to make sure that the organization is creating value as well, isn't it? And of course, they also have to make sure that the organization has the sufficient level of resources to engage in ESG issues. What are ESG issues again? Environmental, social and governance issues, isn't it? So that's basically it. And finally, we have the aspect that, you know, we have to measure, uh, we have to make sure that 
the organization has sufficient level of KPIs or key performance indicators in relation to the areas of sustainability as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the basic role of our management accountant in the area of sustainability. And not just this, we, we also have to, you know, the management accountants also have to plan for things. However, they have to implement things appropriately and make sure that all these measures or all these KPIs have are being you know, monitor once in a while as well, isn't it? So, for example, we have to conduct controlling activities to be, uh, you know, to be, to to put it very basically. Uh, what they have to do is we have to compare the actual, you know, KPIs with targets and make sure that there's no deviation. If there is some sort of deviation that we investigate, they have to investigate into it, isn't it? So, that's basically the idea behind uh, the role of management accountant in sustainability. Okay, folks, as simple as that. Now, moving on. So yeah, that's all for part A of the syllabus. Now let's take a look at part B, shall we? Which is performance management information systems and developments in technology. So folks, in this particular syllabus area, the first and foremost thing that we look at is the aspect in relation to big data and data analytics. Okay, folks, and there are a lot of interesting topics that we learn here. Now, what is big data? Big data is basically a huge set of big data that we use to analyze the patterns and trends, and we use it to extract useful information for various business purposes, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Now let's quickly read through it, shall we? Big data is a collection and analysis of uh, a large amount of data to find trends, uh, trends, understand customer needs and help organization to focus resources more effectively. That's basically why we use big data and works. It's a collection of extremely large uh, data or data sets that may be analyzed to reveal patterns, trends, and associations, especially relating to human behavior and interactions. So this is why we use big data for. Now, what are the characteristics of big data? There are three primary characteristics and, you know, two other, uh, you know, I would say additional characteristics as well. Now, let's take a look at each of these, shall we? <clears throat> First of all, there is volume, isn't it? Volume refers to the scale of information that can be stored and created. And then there is velocity. Velocity is basically refers to the speed at which data can be generated. And finally, we have veraz, uh, variety, which is basically the fact that big data consists of a wide variety of data that includes both structured and unstructured data as well. And there's a fourth we called veracity, which is all about the accuracy uh, of, of these particular aspects. Okay, folks, sorry, of these particular information provided within big data. Okay, folks, that's basically another aspect. And of course, there's an additional factor which involves, you know, assessing the cost of extracting this information as well. Does the uh, benefit exceed the cost of extracting uh, or using, conducting or conducting data analytics? That's basically something that we also have to look at here as well, isn't it? So remember that. Moving on to the next aspect, we have implications of big data analytics. Let's take a look at that. Uh, so data analytics can improve marketing to a certain extent, isn't it? So we will be able to analyze various, you know, data to identify patterns and trends uh, and information regarding how customers react to our products, etc. And of course, we can also identify what kind of customers would be interested in our product and we can conduct something called known as target marketing to a certain extent as well. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. And secondly, there is better customer service and relationship management. So what is this What is this all about? Well, we, we can, if we, if we have more information about the customers, we would be able to provide them with services which can increase their satisfaction levels. Isn't it? So that's basically the thing. And of course, it uh, increases, help increases customer loyalty to a certain extent. It can, uh, you know, uh, provide us with better competitive strength. It can increase operational efficiency as well as help discover a new source of revenue as well. Okay, folks, so all these are basically some positive advantages of using big data and data analytics techniques, isn't it? So remember these, these are all really important and, uh, you know, uh, you can use these points in several areas in the scenario if, 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 if this is tested in the exam. Okay, folks, <clears throat> so keep this in mind. Now, moving on to some more really interesting topics. So how exactly or what, exa what exactly are the methods in which we can conduct big data analytics? Let's sorry, data analytics. Let's take a look at that, shall we? So first of all, there is the descriptive method where we look at what has happened, isn't it? So the idea here is that we look at inform uh, historical information and then identify patterns and trends. Okay, folks, this is a, uh, a starting point and we collect, organize and present historical data in an understandable data, understandable manner. What are we doing here, guys? We are collecting uh, historic data, we are processing it and we are presenting it in a particular understandable manner, as simple as that. 
And moving on to the next stage, that is uh, diagnostic or why did it happen? What, what is the idea here? This involves analyzing the data to find connection between different sets of data. So what are we doing here again? We're analyzing the historic data. So in, uh, <clears throat> in descriptive, what, the, what we did was we collected, we organized and presented the information in an understandable manner. And in diagnostic, we're analyzing the data to get more information out of it or insights out of it. Okay, folks. And these two methods are like the backward looking methods. Okay, folks, or the historic methods, I would say. Now, uh, moving on to the forward looking methods, what's the idea here? We have predictive analysis or uh, what will happen next. Okay, folks, so as the name suggests itself, we are predicting the future to a certain extent, isn't it? Not, uh, you know, with 100% accuracy or anything, but with the information that we have available. Okay, folks, so this, this involves using historical and current data to predict how things may unfold in particular areas of the business, allowing organizations to develop initiatives to enhance performance. What's the idea here, guys? We're using historical as well as current information to predict what's going to happen in the future, to put it very simply, isn't it? And finally, we have prescriptive as well. So in prescriptive, it's basically all about what action should be taken next. So we've identified some aspect that's going to happen in the future. Now, what is, what is our action against it? So that's basically what is this particular method is all about. So this involves combining predictive analysis with AI. What is AI? Artificial intelligence, okay, folks, or, and machine learning algorithms to anticipate what, when, and more importantly, why something might happen. So we're predicting things using artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all those uh, uh, systems and softwares, okay, folks. So that's basically the idea here. So these, these were basically some methods of data analytics. There are also other alternative methods of data analytics as well. So let's read through each of these. There is text analytics. And what is text analytics all about? The existing text, which is obtained from various sources, for example, customer feedback, questions, or uh, other comments are analyzed to obtain valuable insights. So we analyze the, you know, customer feedback provided in our websites or, you know, other comments pro provided in our social media pages, etc., cetera, and, uh, you know, obtain more insights from the uh, particular uh, text itself as to whether, as to what the customer is thinking about the organization, our products, etc. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And then there is image analytics as well. What's the idea here, guys? This is the extraction of useful information from many digital images. Image uh, analysis technology has a variety of uses, for example, scanning barcodes or QR codes. So what's the idea here, guys? There, there's something called digital images. So from digital images, we scan valuable information. Okay, folks, that's basically it. An example is scanning QR codes or barcodes. That's basically the, uh, the idea here. <clears throat> and then there is video analytics, which is basically, uh, you know, analyzing historical or real-time video to gain some insights from it. That's basically all there is to it. And of course, there is also voice analytics, which is basically, uh, uh, it can be used to automatically identify and analyze speech, including words and phrases. That's basically it. And finally, we have something called sentiment analysis. The others were kind of obvious. However, what is sentiment analysis all about? It's all about the, uh, you know, uh, psychological emotion that the particular individual would have through, uh, by, you know, posting something. Uh, on our company's website or or what exactly do they mean or what exactly is there is the sentiment behind the set of words that's that has been uh, you know posted in our uh, comment section or posted in our customer feedback form etc that's basically the idea here so this is the process of determining emotional tone behind a series of words to gain understanding of attitudes opinion and emotions as simple as that okay folks so that's basically as to what sentiment analysis is all about now moving on to the next aspect we have service industries as well. So what is service industries? So service industry is basically a business that <clears throat> does work for a customer and occasionally provides goods, but it, it is not involved in manufacturing. It includes banking, professional services, etc. Isn't it? So we all know what a service organized, sorry, service industry is or a service business is, isn't it? Something that does not conduct manufacturing functions, but rather they provide services like banking services or professional services or it could even be uh, you know as, uh, aspect like a beauty salon etc isn't it so that's basically the idea here and what exactly are the characteristics of services it's intangible first of all isn't it there is no tangible product that they provide isn't it it's just the service itself that's basically it and secondly 
there is heterogeneity and variability because a service provided to one individual may not be the same service that's provided to another individual as well. That's basically the idea here. Uh, and then there is perishability as well. So yeah, there's no aspect of perishability or there's no tangible product to perish, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. And then there is simultaneity as well. The provision of service and the consumption of service is done at the same time, isn't it? So that's basically the idea. And of course, lack of ownership. We cannot own the service in any way, isn't it? Or the customer cannot own the service anyway. Or uh, unless, of course, you uh, you know own the particular individual who's providing the service, you, you, you can't necessarily own it, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Well, that seems kind of weird, isn't it? So yeah, moving on uh, to the next aspect. We have measuring service quality and what's the idea here? Uh, strength of advice given. So how exactly can we uh, measure the quality of service provided? First of all, what we can do is we can uh, pro we can take a look at the strength of advice given. Okay, what exactly is that? Well, that's basically the advice given to the uh, particular service provider as to how they should interact with customers, what kind of Methodologies should they use, etc. Okay, folks, that's basically the thing. And attitude of workers. Okay, folks, it depend, depends upon the attitude of workers because, uh, you know, they're the one, the workers are the one who's interacting directly with the customers, isn't it? So if the workers do does something, you know, bad or unsatisfactory to the customers, then uh, we would have a bad reputation, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. And of course, atmosphere of the premise is also important. Do we have the sufficient level of resources, infrastructure, etc., you know, to provide the service? And of course, there's the speed of service as well. Uh, are we uh, able to provide quality service at a reasonable time? Or is there too much of a waiting time in our business? That's basically some things that we can look at. We can also look at uh, flexibility and responsiveness. Can we or are we able to meet the customer's expectation or a customer's changing expectation, etc.? And of course, there is consistent quality. Okay, folks, can we, are, are we able to keep up our quality consistently that's basically it for example for some uh, business organization that i've seen uh in nearby or uh let's say within my premises i've seen that there were new businesses and initially uh, let's say let's say uh you know hotel hotels or uh, i would say you know restaurants let's take a restaurant for example initially they might provide the best food in the world isn't it however after let's say a few months or after a few years their food you know doesn't necessarily uh, wasn't necessarily uh, you know as great as what it was initially isn't it so the idea here is that are we able to keep up the quality or are we able to uh, are, are is the particular service business able to consistently uh, have the same quality or are, or are they improving upon the quality or are they declining it that's basically the idea that we have to measure in this particular aspect okay books as simple as that so these are basically just some methods that, that can be assessed or that the, some areas that we can focus on to make sure that we are providing quality service to our customers in a service business. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. Now, moving on, the service providers will establish its CSFs and the management accountant will have an important role in the following things. So we're talking about performance measurement in a service business. How can we measure that? Well, what we can do is we can, of course, establish CSFs or critical success factors in the business, isn't it? Of course, this is something that we can do uh, commonly for both manufacturing organizations as well as service organ uh, service businesses as well, isn't it? Service organizations are something else, so uh, keep that in mind. Okay, folks, so now moving on, uh, we'll have an important role in the following things. So we have to identify the appropriate KPIs because we know the process, isn't it? We set the objective for the organization, we identify the KPIs, then we use, sorry, identify the CSFs, and then we use KPI to measure those, measure the extent to which we have excelled in the CSF, and then we monitor performance, isn't it? So that's basically the same approach here. Okay, folks, we identify appropriate KPIs, we, uh, you know, uh, assemble the KPI information or the information that is required to calculate these KPIs, and then we examine this information for better understanding, we uh, also advise the organization based on this understanding and finally apply what has been learned to help the organization achieve its strategic objectives. Simple process to evaluate the performance of a service business as simple as that. Okay, folks. Now, moving on to the next aspect that is 